do you see happening with housing and real estate and mortgages and all this kind of stuff? I mean, with all the foreclosures that have gone on and the way the banks have taken them back illegally, is it just going to be just a lot more of a big mess, or is there some some kind of an industry or some kind of a path that I can start looking at to help people in that regard? Uh you hold dinar, do you, honey? And I don't want to know how much, but you yes, hold dinar. Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Okay. So as soon as this come down, comes down, you're going to be okay. Uh, mm-hmm. As soon as this comes down, and I don't know how soon after it's made public, but you are going to get back everything you've ever paid into IRS, okay? So financially, I think you're going to be fine. Uh, as far as being a real estate broker, real estate profession is going to go bye-bye. We're not going to have insurance companies or insurance agents. We're not going to have real estate brokers or the the, um, National Real Estate Association, of which I was a member for many years. I've got both my gold and my silver R buttons, and um, I was vice president of our commercial investment division for two years and instituted some wonderful things for the group. But all of that's going away, so you are going to have to, you know, uh, with your knowledge now, if if you run across somebody that's got a lot of money and they want to make a real estate purchase, uh, you won't be governed by the same rules and regulations under the uh, under what you might do as a private contractor, an independent contractor, under personal agreement with somebody that has money. If they want you to be their agent to go out and find a particular property for them, you can do that. You might work for. Um, a group of investors or um, a foundation. Of course, I don't think they're going to call them foundations. I think that terminology is going to go by by do, but I'm not sure on that one. <clears throat> but <clears throat> there's not going to be any CPAs. They'll be, be accountants, but you're not going to have to owe your soul to the devil to, to do your profession. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to contract with somebody that was a CPA that uh, has had a lot of training and so forth, or a really good accountant to help me handle my book work and so forth, because we're still going to have to have personal book work, you see. But as far as uh, real estate agents, um, they won't exist anymore. If, if somebody wants to buy a piece of property, they will pick out a property and they'll deal directly with the owner. Wow. And as far as title companies, title companies are going to go bye-bye. They're corrupt also. And um, when I was, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. You're familiar with Chicago Title Insurance? I certainly am. Yeah, they were one of the premier title insurance companies when I was um, working the industry in the uh, late 70s and all through the 80s. Um, and in the particular met- metropolitan area that I worked in, they failed on one case. They did not protect the buyer in the way that they should have. And so it put a scourge on the entire industry, especially Chicago, because <clears throat> we used to think extremely highly of Chicago. So things started falling apart back in those days, if you will. And and I was uh, I was absolutely appalled. You know what an abstract is. You were probably in it long enough to know abstract. Yes, yep. Okay. Well, there was this one community where a former president had his his, uh, he, he was from that area, so there was a pre- presidential home and a historic society. And, and I got wind that the uh, brokers in that particular town were burning, or the title, title companies, I'm sorry, the title companies were burning the abstracts. And I thought had a joke. I couldn't believe it. I'm thinking, oh, my God, all the history of, uh, of information and the following on that property of an abstract, and it was in an area that was very historic, and I mean, I, I, I've seen things revealed. Wow. I could not believe over the years. This this whole thing is is rampant with people that are just after money and corruption and destroying all the foundation of our country. Wow. Carol, may I interject one moment? What about mortgage brokers? Um, oh, they're, I know gone. It, they're gone. They're gone. Okay. They're gone. The mortgage industry is gone. There will be no more of that. I don't know how. Uh, I haven't been made privy of how people are going to buy a home uh, without paying for it uh, cash. <clears throat> I'm sure that there'll be a provision, but it won't be through the, the banks, okay? Now, for those of you that weren't on last night's call and you don't know this yet, I'd like to reassure you that all monies that you are owing on a car, on a loan, on a car, or a mortgage, 
through a Federal Reserve Bank, which most all banks are. Uh, now, North Dakota has their own money system, and I don't know that they're using the Federal Reserve Banks for mortgages. I don't know what their system is up there. I haven't talked to anybody in the know on it. <laughs> but the Federal Reserve and the IRS are, are going to be gone, and all of the loans, uh, all of the college loans, uh, everything, are they, they're going to be zeroed out. There are not going to be any more existing balances. Now, if you have purchased a home contract for deed from an individual, uh, relative, or that kind of thing, those loans, from what I understand, will endure. However, uh, from what I've been told, they will have to be renegotiated with either no interest or very minimal interest. And maybe, you know, and of course, like I said last night, and of course this might put everybody tonight that's not that wasn't on the call last night into a tailspin, so I'll take time to uh, go through that now if you want me to. But Sure, sure, please do. Our economy is going to be reduced by 90%. Uh, in the, the inflation over the years has been astronomical. What you paid 19 cents a gallon for gasoline back in the 50s, now we're paying, what, 3 and, and $4. Some, pla- some places up to almost $5 a gallon. <laughs> so you can see the kind of fat that is in our uh, has been put into our inflation in our country, and uh, I heard somebody on one call say something about how stable the U.S. dollar is. The, the U.S. dollar is worth almost nothing. I mean, it you know some people say it's worth 75 to 74 cents. Uh, Tampa Tom was on a call last year or earlier this year, and he said, "Folks, the value of the dollar is is between two cents and four cents," and so. There, there's a wide variance of thought on that, but the the dollar uh, is not a stable dollar at all. And uh, <laughs> when we change currencies and so forth, uh, it's going to be a real value. Now, I'm, the way I'm going to explain this changeover of the 90% to you, try to listen carefully because it, it's very confusing to most people. And... Uh, I have come up with a way to explain it that I think works for a lot of people, but if it doesn't, please ask, and I'll do the best I can to clarify it. If you have a dollar in your hand today, and let's just say that the NASAR announcement is made tomorrow, which I don't know that it will be. (coughs) Excuse me. Once the NASAR announcement is made or the Treasury is put into... um, constitutional mode and the 90% uh, inflation is taken out, you're going to have a dime in your hand where that dollar was today. However, and I want you to listen very carefully because I don't want anybody confused on this and go off in fear on this. It's very simple. What you had as a dollar today, tomorrow you would have as a dime, but that dime is going to buy the same amount of product as the dollar did today, okay? You aren't going to be losing anything. Any questions on that at this point? I think we're good. Well, if somebody gets, you know, thinking about it and wants some clarification on it later down, please don't hesitate to ask. And things don't have to be on this talk tonight. We don't have to be in any kind of order as far as jumping around subjects. When these things crop up into your mind and you want to ask, interrupt me and ask because you're going to lose that thought. If you're anything like me, I can't write fast enough to write all my thoughts down and, and then it's gone and I've lost it, you know. So, hey, Carol? Carol? Yes, sir. I, I do have a question and sorry to interrupt. Uh, I know last night someone asked about offshore and while you're on this subject about the changeover in money, would it be better if we moved our money maybe to a country that isn't going to go through this upheaval or change so that it would stay the same purchasing value? And I know last night you kind of frowned on that. Maybe you could go into that again if you would, please. Uh, let me ask this lady that has been uh, speaking if that would be okay with her. Oh, sure. Uh-huh. I didn't mean to step on anyone. I'm sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. no. We're not worried about Carol? I just want to oh. make sure she's covered. Uh, Carol, that would be fine, and and then um, I just had a follow up I, uh, based on what you were just talking about, but that's fine. Don't don't lose your thought, honey. Can you write it down? Yes, ma'am. I certainly will. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You're welcome, dear. Um, I mentioned this last night, uh, sir, and I'll mention it again. I think I mentioned it earlier, but 
Uh, you may have stepped away and, and missed it, and that's okay. We'll cover it as many times as we need to. Do not, well, I'm not going to say do not. <laughs> My feeling is I'm not going to do anything offshore. It's a, As far as I'm concerned about offshore, it's a trap. I think you're going to be safer on U.S. soil than anywhere else in the world. Now, you have to understand this is a worldwide change. Almost all countries are going to revalue their money at the same time. <clears throat> this is a huge, massive endeavor, never done before in the history of humanity as far as we know, and uh, probably will never happen again. And so we're all kind of the blind leading the blind, okay? But let me tell you something about offshore stuff. I spoke about this last night, about my friend George that died in February of this year. He was a year behind me in high school, and we dated for a short time. But uh, his family was very kind to me, and they had the original newspaper for Huntington Beach, California, since 1903. They're a very prominent family. And um, I kept in touch with George throughout the years, hither and thither. We, we didn't stay real close, but we, whenever I had a question about something, I'd call him or whatever, and and he was known as a white knight, okay? In the corporate world, a white knight is a person that goes in to a company that is a viable company, but they're having a rocky road financially and it doesn't look like they're going to make it. So if a white knight chooses an industry and this company falls within that industry and, and they think they can pull it out and make a go of it, they'll step in and take over the country or co uh, company temporarily he went down into Florida. One of the companies that he was uh, helping out uh, was a three-year endeavor approximately. So he moved down to Florida from the West Coast, and he stayed with that company until he got it back on its feet, and then he turned loose of it again. That is known as a white knight, not in the realm we're talking about as far as Nassara and taking our country back, but that's what white knights in the corporate world do. This man had an IQ of at least 180, if not 200, which is extremely high. And he had stock brokerages in London, um, Los Angeles, and Chicago until 87 when uh, Joe Granville, I forgot his name last night and I knew Joe, uh, uh, from Kansas City, uh, who wrote a massive newsletter, had, you know, he charged big bucks for his newsletter. It was over $300 a year. And investors would uh, be his subscribers. And, he, he's the one that triggered the 1987 uh, stock market crash. And George uh, did the same stuff. He had these three stock brokerages, and he wrote uh, newsletters for stock brokerage houses, houses, and they paid him for the, uh, you know, it was like it was copyrighted material, trademarked and copyrighted, and the stock brokerages would purchase George's newsletters, his financial newsletters, and put it out under their their banner, if you will, like, you know, let's just say um, uh, Edwards uh, Stock Brokerage, they would purchase George's newsletter and, and put it with their banner on it and sold it to their investors on a monthly basis, subscription, uh, as their own. So George was a brilliant financial guru, if you will. And I called him here a few years ago and I said, George, I said, uh, what can you tell me about Swiss, uh, Swiss banks and everything? I says, you know, what's your advice as far as dealing with Swiss banks? And he said, Carol, he says, a few years ago, he says, I brought all my business onshore. And he says, I have just found that it's a lot less complicated and you stay out of trouble. He said, the, the banks in Switzerland, you've got two varieties of banks. You've got the good old family banks, and then you've got the... Um, Oh, like the government banks and that kind of thing. And uh, one was better than the other, okay? And you had to know which bank to deal with. But <clears throat> when you go offshore, you don't know their culture. You don't know their rules, their regulations, and their laws. And there's so much you don't know. Why would you do it? Now, as far as going offshore, to me, it's a trap to trap you into paying big bucks set up an IBC and a foreign corporation offshore and all this baloney that they charge you, 